Hello and a very warm welcome to you. They are being threatened with murder, with rape and assault and subjected to vicious online abuse. Is enough being done to protect black and ethnic minority women in politics? You're watching Round Table with me, David Foster. Of course, politics can be a tough business, and criticism does come with the job. But many black and ethnic minority women who are politicians say they're facing levels of abuse that go way beyond fair comment. British and American black female politicians are 84% more likely than their white counterparts to be victims of abusive tweets, according to Amnesty International. For all minorities, this figure stands at 34%. In the UK, Member of Parliament Diane Abbott says she receives, on average, 51 racist, misogynistic and sexually violent tweets every day. The right-wing media has been blamed for inflating the problem through disproportionate scrutiny of women like US Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ilhan Omar. Ocasio-Cortez says everything from her intelligence, family upbringing and wardrobe have been ridiculed. Earlier this month, Congresswoman Omar was pictured on a poster at a Republican-sponsored event, appearing to liken her to a 9-11 terrorist. Twitter says it is publicly committed to improving the collective health, openness and civility of public conversation on its service. But is enough being done to protect minority women in politics from excessive scrutiny and online abuse? And of course, it's not just about women in politics, it's about women who put themselves forward in every walk of life. Pleased to say that joining us from Los Angeles, we have Lark Lowe from the Socialist Party USA. With me in the studio, writer and journalist Margie Orford. Salma Yacoub is here, political activist and former Respect Party leader, and Malia Boatia, former president of the National Union of Students. Each one of you, warm welcome by the way, each one of you in your own way has received a form of abuse that you found incredibly threatening. Lark, let's go to you first of all, since you happen to be in California, a long way away. Very good of you to stay up this late or get up this early in the morning. What, what, what kind of abuse did you get? And was it because you thought you were black and a woman? Well, you know, the thing is that it's, while it's a personal thing, it's also about a worldview. Be aware of the fact that, the, that, that we on the left can be shut down and the current tools the right is using is bots. I mean, all of these heinous attacks against like people like myself who are like small, but also, you know, people like Meghan Markle. They found out that many of the attacks that she was getting were from the same accounts and from a, the same few accounts. And I found the same case with myself. So, well, you first of all, you, you quit, didn't you, because the abuse was, was bad? No, to be fair, I didn't quit because of... OK, abuse. the it's abuse true. was bad and you quit. Yes, um, so the, the two were not related. OK. But yes, I've had death threats, um, I've had um, verbal abuse, um, I've had online abuse, and even when I stood in the Birmingham City Chamber when I uh, was elected, I was told to go back um, where you come from, and that was from the official leader of the council. Um, at that time. Is this because you were a woman and they saw you as a, as a potentially weaker target? Do you think a Muslim man would have had the same, faced the same abuse? I think it's a combination of if you're a woman who challenges, um, then it's that uppity woman and you should know your place. If you happen to be a woman of colour, and I think right now anybody who is Muslim or is seen to be supportive of Muslims in particular, um, I think there is a hierarchy of kind of acceptable and non-acceptable and if you're a woman on the left if for example I espoused a different type of politics I think I probably wouldn't have received the level of abuse that I do. So you, you can sympathize with Lark who represents the Socialist Party which, which is probably one of the smallest parties in the United States apart from Bernie Sanders we don't hear very much about it altogether. All Malia, white women would they receive the same kind of abuse um, in politics? I mean, you, you've been an activist, you've been yeah. in the national, no, almost uh, politics. No, of course, white women do experience forms of misogyny and patriarchy. You know, even Theresa May <laughs> deals with that form of abuse. But I think that, it, you know, to reinforce Salma's point, if you hold the politics that 
is critical of power structures, uh, of the question of privilege, of hierarchy in our society and of structural oppression, uh, then that abuse uh, you know, is turned up to another level. And also it's difficult uh, to engage on the basis of all women experiencing a form of misogyny and therefore having solidarity when I know the likes of Theresa May may experience uh, forms of sexism and misogyny within her institution and as uh, uh, as a leader, uh, but her politics reinforces my own oppression. And so we have to be very clear that actually if you stand on a certain platform, you are dehumanized on another level uh, because your politics uh, seeks to completely uh, rip to shreds uh, all, the, all that encourages a culture of hatred. Could it, could it not, not just simply be, but could it not be in part because a black woman in politics who's mouthy is a rarity and therefore you stand out a bit more? I would, yeah, I'd probably... Attract attention but not a bit, yeah, something like that. Um, I think that we, we can't... I think, uh, of course, that does happen. Uh, it's not a rarity, it depends where you're looking. Uh, women of colour have been part of all political movements, structures and institutions. It's just that they're kept at the very bottom. So I wouldn't say that it's, it's not that we've ever been in those spaces before. Uh, but further than that, it's again uh, reinforcing the platform that you run on. The does this that abuse you keep to... women of colour at the bottom? Of course. Mm. It... Okay. Uh, freedom yeah, of speech. I, 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 now, I, Lark, I'll come back to you in just a minute, but okay. I want to bring Margie okay. in at this particular okay. point. You've had abuse too. You're not a politician, but, but you're. You, you... All women are politicians. Being a woman is a political act. So <laughs> I would say that one of the things that we share is that any presence in public life is seen as political mm -hmm. and it's politically offensive. So I think just before, I'm not, I don't ho hold political office, but the intersection of race, class, gender, um, ethnic origin, geographical origin, come together in different forms um, in the kind of abuse that we, that women receive. So I'm a white woman, that I don't get the racist abuse, but I just want to say I'm a South African where Obviously, black women on the black people, black women on the majority, and their number of black women MPs, a great number, they receive very similar kind of abuse online from this sort of um, misogynistic abuse that women get here. So it's a complex, it's a complex thing. I, I wrote down here: Can you categorise who does the abusing? Yes. Yeah. Go on. I think you, I mean the area that I've worked in for a long time is around free speech. So I came to free speech work having been the patron of rape crisis in South Africa for a long time, where violence against women is, is extremely high. And one of the things I noticed there is that women were often attacked um, because they were stepping outside. They were in the public domain. They were in the street. They were in a bar. They were walking home. They were in the garden, for instance. So there's a perception that women should be excluded from all sorts of public space. And I see violence against women as a free speech um, issue. So in many countries, you've had removal of restrictions of what women can say in public. The legal impediment is no longer there, as it was in England till about 10 minutes ago, say 100 years ago. What you have is very, very punitive um, physical threats around women stepping outside what are their allocated roles. But I did say, can you categorize who does the abuse? Okay, so who does it? If you look at the amnesty report that was released recently where they looked at who was doing abusing, it, a number of um, accounts, if we're looking at online thing, the answer to who does it is it's almost always men, in my experience, who, who, who have done it to me, and I'm sure to all of you. Um, but if we're looking at uh, specifically on the internet, it's a number of accounts. Diane Abbott, for instance, got half of all the abusive tweets that Amnesty quantified in the, in the research that they did. There's a small number of troll accounts which are extremely coordinated. Um, as our American friend was saying, Ocasio-Cortez gets the mm. same thing. So one of the things I think we should focus the debate in is not what is with the women being in public and why do we get trouble. How is it that the internet, in particular, this unregulated way, is fueling this kind of attack? Can we come to that a little bit later in the program? Because I want to, want to go to Lark one, once more. One of the things that I picked up on was that it's, it, Margie is saying, yes, it's mostly men. 
who deliver the abuse. But I, I have read somewhere that it is mostly considered to be white, privileged men who feel scared that their position is being undermined. Do you recognize that? I do recognize that it's white, privileged men, but I feel that who is doing the trolling, that a lot of them are bots. And Should we call controlled... it abusing rather than trolling? It's abusing. Trolling yeah, yeah, is sort abusing. of almost sort of slightly jovial, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exa yeah, exactly. Yeah, let's call it abuse. It's, it's... Abuse, but I think the thing is that we, you know, we're trying to make this, um, a lot of people try to make this a personal thing, whereas I think that it's a, you know, um, very organized, orchestrated by the right. Um, they say, oh, it's white men who's doing it. Of course, well, the white men who are in power, who are doing it, but it's not necessarily individual accounts. I think it's, it's a little bit bigger than that. It's, it's more than just a person in their basement um, troll or, or abusing people because the amount of abuse that people like Abbott, um, Cortez, Omar are getting. I mean, it can't just be one person with a little computer. It's, it's, it's lots of money by people with lots of power who are afraid of losing that power, who are afraid of universal housing, universal childcare, um, basic income. They're afraid of these kinds yeah. of things. They want to all be oppressed. Clearly, it is more than just one person doing it. Clearly, it, you know, it, it is hundreds upon thousands. But are you saying it's not just hundreds of thousands of shadows who happen to be stuck in their basement with nothing better to do? Are you suggesting that it is organized? Mm. Oh, uh, definitely. I definitely think it's organized. I definitely think, you know, these PACs, which in the United States are money that is raised millions and billions of dollars. They're raised by politicians. And they have actually used the internet, um, cyberspace, as their tool to oppress and to shut down women. In the past, they used things like, oh, you can't vote. Or in the past, they used things like, we're not going to give you child care in the United States. So now what they're using is cyberspace. They always, you know, there's always a tool that they use. And they use, black women aren't necessarily louder, but we always are oppressed more loudly because we are very obvious in regards to our, our, our appearance. So if you loudly oppress black women, um, you can quietly oppress everyone else within capitalism because you're kind of focused on, oh, OK, um, we're going to focus on this black woman and we're going to har harass her. We're going to take um, she's talking about universal health care, universal child care. But instead of talking about that, let's focus on the fact that we want to do something horrible to her. And then the conversation becomes around that instead okay. of uh, the actual issue that we were discussing. Salma's been dying to say something. No, I, I think it is beyond just individuals because yes you can kind of go oh it's just a few shadows um, and without um, getting into conspiracy theories the facts are we have had operations like Cambridge Analytica mm. we have got big moneyed um, input when it comes to swaying elections and it just so happens that the nexus is people who are privileged who have got a lot to kind of lose or they think just by sharing even a tiny bit more whether it's a bit more tax if you're super rich and that kind of aligns with the, a, a false identity politics yeah. where they're whipping up people to say that your whole identity be, is under attack and we're getting a lot of white victimhood now this this feeling of you know who are we now we're being swamped you know these all these issues where it might not have it's, it might not be actually rooted in a reality but there's a kind of a psychological space where people actually genuinely and subjectively and in their own self are feeling that they're being marginalized whether it's by women who you know up till fairly recently you know had uh, more were more in a private space not in a public space and by people of color um, and so i think there's different agendas overlapping and but at the same time i do think there's a systematic coordinated effort and some of the same people you'll find lie behind that. Th there's a, re there's a reason perhaps there. to be quite pleased about that because if people feel threatened by something, it sometimes means that the people yeah. who are doing the threatening, supposedly, are succeeding. Yeah, and I think what we're seeing, especially in the UK, as an example, is someone like Diane Abbott, who's been in politics for a long time. She was the first black female MP. She's been elected since the 80s. But the abuse she's getting now is unparalleled. And I don't think it's not unconnected to the fact that there may well be uh, a Labour government led by Jeremy Corbyn, mm. who, uh, because of the politics and the policies that he represents, is himself being vilified. And he's not a woman and he's not a person of colour, but because of the politics of equality, 
that he represents. We should add, Diane even though Abbott. it's entirely irrelevant, that he did at one stage have a relationship. Well, again, that's Diane the point. Abbott. It's irrelevant. A lot of people in, in public uh, spaces have had yeah. relations with each other. And that was a really interesting point just brought up there, because she was treated in a very different way on BBC Question Time. Forget about the shadows in the basements. We're talking about a respected institution and I still very much believe in a public funded um, broadcaster like the BBC mm. and I think it's uh, a real shame that they also reflect this culture of denigration. She's been uh, on Treasury Select Committee, on Foreign Policy Select Committee, yet she was introduced like that and she got interrupted three times more than her Tory um, opponent. So there and that wasn't just that because she says controversial things? No, actually. It's because she's black and she's no, a woman. Yeah? And not just that, when she actually came out with the fact which um, was actually correct, she was told it was incorrect and people just piled in. Yeah. So and that, that, was, that was a new presenter, as I believe it. On the other hand, she has at times used of figures course. which are and entirely wrong. And people like wrong. Boris Johnson have got okay. things totally oh. wrong, but Double they standards. are still yeah. treated Absolutely. as credible authority well, people but, in public but, life and I think there is a double standard. Yeah but to. also I would I would add that this uh, the, the the heightened attacks also relate to structural questions that actually what is uh, what is encouraging this culture of uh, of, of uh, uh, confident abuse whether it's online or even on the streets this is you know it is reaching alarming stages why because on a policy level these things are being reinforced uh, the you know the othering the targeting and the uh, the blaming of migrants of people of color of muslims of anything other or anything that represents progress in any way shape or form or potential god forbid left-wing socialist future becomes threatening and so we have to so in in our like identification of who is doing the abusing we have to reinforce and not play into you know uh, the, the pitfalls of identity politics as Salma pointed okay, out can, can, this is straight up um, would you as a young person who've been active in student politics yeah. given what you've heard from everybody around this table given what you encounter on an everyday basis yeah. and what you read and hear about, about Diane Abbott etc etc would you consider a career in politics uh, well, you see, I don't see politics as a career, and I think part of the problem that we have with politicians is that they seem to see it as like a space. Okay, a let, let me rephrase that. That's a different question. Would you consider a uh, life in politics? Yes, and I continue to. It doesn't mean that I see it in within political parties. You, so you think despite, it's worth it, and yet, yeah, yeah despite, just, yes, absolutely, because that's part of the struggle. What what I experienced as the first woman of color, the first Muslim, uh, and president of the National Union of Students after almost a hundred years. Uh, um, was necessary. It, it showed people exactly what these institutions, who they were built for, and what and, and what the pitfalls were in terms of liberation politics. And we demonstrated that. Obviously, that came as a personal and mental <laughs> cost to me, but it was it was part of my commitment to the movement. Margie, in just a struggle. second, if you don't mind, because I want to ask you this one, last one, yeah. Malia. Do, do you agree then that this kind of abuse almost means that you're succeeding? Yes. Like you wanted to say something. Yeah, and it will I, come to you, like, because you're, you're nodding as well. I think that, yeah. you know, as, as all the, the women here have said, we all know this, we're dealing with a systemic issue and perhaps one of the most ancient systemic issues. And at the heart of it is um, a fear of how of that the patriarchy has to use. I'm so glad that word has returned. It was the word of the 80s is back again, and it's a very helpful word that authority rests with men. It's ancient Greek concept. You have the doxa, male, the voice of authority mm. is a male voice, a white male voice in particular. What the disruption that we see, and I would be very wary of saying we're winning by getting death threats. I mean, I've had cycles. I know it that. sounds barking mad, but I think you no, know what I mean, don't you? Yeah. It's doing not, I do know what you, well, you, you do something by just being alive, which is interesting. I mean, you can be absolutely not in the public domain. So I would be wary, I would be really wary of saying we're winning. I think what we see now is a really, really strong backlash mm -hmm. to the most basic gains. Yeah. yeah in women's rights, really the most basic gains, the most basic gains in terms of ethnic minority rights in the UK. Did so I would be, I would really not make it funny and not make it a women's issue. Yeah. What we're looking at is, what I've seen in the last few years, is an enabling of violence, which is really frightening. So for instance, the murder of Joe Cox. Yes. I moved to the UK we, we, just we should, before. We should point out to those who don't understand it. She, Joe she was Cox, a sitting British MP, MP, first MP murdered in a generation. Yes. 
she was relatively young and she was white and she was she was, she was murdered. And she, she, the murder happened. Did I happened. need to mention that she was white, do you think, or did I get that wrong? She but was. she was left okay. wing. She was left yeah. wing, and, and she was very sympathetic. She was murdered. So she was was she supported the, immigrants. Exactly, and so. she was murdered within the rhetoric that began with the Brexit campaign, mm -hmm. the very, very dangerous, xenophobic, racist campaign, mm. highly misogynistic campaign. And what struck me coming in as a foreigner to Britain was that the British press and British people read it as an aberration, this weird, psycho, odd white guy I mean, that he was a member of the British National Party or various right-wing groups was seen as an aberration. To me, it was part of a systemic thing of a woman who spoke out in terms of, of what Lark's been talking about, of a solidarity, a socialist solidarity with others, was murdered. So it was an assassination. So how, how do you change it from within yeah. Yeah. the system? If the system is the one that's putting the message out there that white, I mean, sorry, black women politicians, women in the public eye should be subjugated if it's the system that's putting it out there. Lark, let me ask you this one. How, how do you get around it? Well, I think that, you know, that's, you know, instead of letting them control the narrative, mm. um, what we should do is it's not so much the system wanting us black women to be quiet or women of color to be quiet. It is the system wanting everyone to be quiet using kind of us as the example mm. of what will happen to you if you are not quiet. This is actually the oppression and the violence towards um, black women is actually violence towards everyone because the issues that is happening in regards to when we are being attacked isn't because we're talking about specifically um, issues that have to do with black people or women or Muslims. The issues that we are discussing are things that will help everyone. Things like, um, wow, we, everyone should not, people should have a place to live. People should be able to have livable wages. People should have health care. These are the things that they're getting upset about. These are they're not they're not getting upset because we're saying, oh, you know, black women, we are awesome. That's not what's happening. The the things that they're getting upset about are things that can help everyone. So this violence isn't specifically, it is against women, but it's actually against everyone. It's against everyone who wants to live a uh, fruitful, helpful. Um, life um, is not oppression. So, 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 so let me throw this one out there, and this, this is for each mm -hmm. one of you. Um, OK, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm a white man sitting at this table, mm -hmm. and I'm fascinated mm -hmm. listening to what you have to say. But I made a note before we went on air which said, isn't it important that we don't just have good black women in politics, in public life? What we need are just good people. Of course. And that's the whole point. Um, and I think everything that's been said around this table is about that. Um, Women like us are not here to say only we should be given spaces. In fact, we're saying everybody should be allowed um, at, literally at the table and not just be grateful for the few crumbs that come out of it. And that's why it's not just about being a woman or just about being a person of colour. For me, it is about power and the sharing of that power. And the, the test for me, the sniff test for me is when you see women of colour, if you're saying this just about this programme focusing of women and colour and in a politics and public space. If you advocate and reinforce the status quo, you're actually relatively safe. Hmm. Condoleezza Rice, for example, doesn't get the kind of abuse that someone like <laughs> Diane Abbott does. So yes, there is an issue about being a woman. Yes, there is, there is an issue about race, but we cannot escape the fact this is about interests at the most. And if I wanted to become very rich overnight, mm. you know, there'd be very easy ways for me to do that. If I was to say, oh, I'm just this oppressed Muslim woman who have now, have now totally denounce my faith and I stand up for all the kind of right-wing um, politics, mm. I, I think I could have a really easy, cushy number. <laughs> it's, it's about the status quo, but also... <laughs> not I funny, really, is it? But, <laughs> but it's I, a I, fact. You, you say it with a smile. This also go, comes back to what the solutions look like. And if, if they're simply about like making sure that we fill spaces with women, with brown and black people, um, uh, then, you know, the right can keep on doing what it's doing, which is tokenism, which is the co-option of liberation. Um, and that's exactly what's happening, which is why I have to reinforce that I, I may fight um, the patriarchy uh, so that even the likes of Theresa May doesn't get that kind of uh, institutional and street level abuse. Uh, but I'm also aware that I am fighting her on the politics of race, of migration, and I'm reinforcing that I, I, I will not take surface level representation, nor will I, uh, uh, you know, give in to, to kind of very tokenistic understandings of what uh, 
bringing in and creating a safe space for women of colour, for women uh, and for minorities within uh, politics looks like? I think it's also it's a systemic thing, as, as you were pointing out. And there, it seems like the, there's two, like if you think, oh, how do we change things? which is what I'm interested in as a, mm. an activist. Mm. How do we change things? How do we shift things? There are two understandings of power. The one is what you find on the right, where sharing power means loss for me. Yeah. That's, that's a particularly destructive thing. It's environmentally destructive, all of those things. Another notion of power is that the more power and authority each person gets, you have an accumulation of shared power and authority, which leads to a far well, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm really going to have to stop you. Thank you very, very much indeed. I know there's an awful lot more than everybody here at the table and indeed in Los Angeles. Lark for that. Uh, a great deal more to be said, but it can't be said because we've run out of time. Thank you for watching Roundtable. I'm David Foster. We hope to have you company next time. Goodbye for now.